All right, with that, we're gonna dive into the words. If you wanna go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter three. Mark chapter three will be in verses 31 to 35 this morning. Uh, As you're turning there, just uh, imagine with me for a moment a couple uh, who approaches the pastor Uh, hoping to get married in in March of this year. So it would be a pretty quick turnaround uh, at this point. As the pastor is uh, asking some questions, we discover that this couple actually just met back in December. So we'd be looking at, you know, roughly four months from acquaintance to altar. Um, A little more probing, this is uh, both individual second marriage that they'd be dealing with and the the male involved uh, has some kids from his previous marriage uh, as well. So the pastor gets the community group together, kind of all talking through this issue and whatnot. Now, this couple has got a lot going in their favor. They are both committed Christians, you know, bearing fruit in their lives, uh, financially stable because of their, you know, age and all of that. Uh, He is a caring, devoted, single father, and she would be a good mother, and the kids adore her uh, already. So this is great. Uh, But as the conversation's going on and whatnot, you know, there there are concerns, of course, the past marital failures uh, of both of them, uh, in addition to the complexity of a blended family, which certainly requires some care. The the community group, the pastors or whatnot, they recommend, um, sure, go ahead and get married in March, 2021. Let's just hold off for a year. Let's do this right. Now, in light of what we've been talking about the last couple weeks, in light of our our condition as humans, our human nature, our our bent towards individualism, and then in light of our culture, which pushes us towards individualism, the response to that would be obvious. What is this couple going to do? They're going to go find a different church. They're going to go find a pastor who will marry them on their timeline and maybe just you know, lie about when they met or something like that this next time out so that they can have this happen. You know, we talked about this two weeks ago. Again, right? you know, our, our culture's mantra is you do you. And part of that then is, well, we do us. All right? So we're gonna do what we wanna do and that means we're getting married. The idea of submitting our individual decisions to the will of the community is totally, totally foreign to us, almost offensive in our culture. And that's especially true when it comes to family. Like I I do what's best for my family and it's really best that you just not get in the way of that. And here's the rub with that approach. This is gonna be a a statement I'm gonna make here and I'm gonna spend the rest of the sermon unpacking it really. Our individualism, including our individualistic approach to natural family will keep us from following Jesus. Will keep us from following Jesus because it keeps us from submitting to the community of Jesus' followers. The story I shared is a real one, not a made up story. Joseph Hellerman uh, shares it, this is a couple that actually approached him uh, at one point and he shares it in his book, When the Church Was a Family. Just gonna say at the outset, I am wildly indebted to that book which we just read together as a staff for most of the content of this sermon, his insights into scripture. What I found so fascinating about the story as he shared it though is that the couple kind of incredibly submitted. They agreed. They held off for that time. It ended up not being a whole year. Everybody felt good about them getting married a little bit earlier than that. But they submitted and they were glad that they did. I just love that personally because not, not even as a pastor but just as a community member, I've given marriage advice on a few occasions. There are four different uh, couples that were planning to get married where I said, I don't think so. I don't think this is a good idea. Like, I think you guys really need to stop and consider this for different reasons. I went 0 for 4 on those. And by the way, the marriages went 0 for 4 also. It just goes to show you something, right? Uh, the, the whole point of what I'm gonna try and say today, like you, you can feel it there. But why did this couple do it? Why did this couple do it? Well, because they submitted to the family of God. They saw themselves as members of a community that had a say in their lives. And what do we keep saying throughout this series? We're saying it's the first question in the catechism we use here, the New City Catechism, right? I'm, I'm not my own, I, be, I belong to God. And that means I submit to him, to his word. I submit to the authorities that he establishes over me in his wisdom. And I submit to the community in which he has placed me. Full disclosure, in many ways, this will be the hardest of the three sermons in this series. 
And it's not like the other two were easy ones. So uh, this, is, this is significant here because we're gonna be talking about the primacy of God's family above the natural family as well as the individual. To do this, we're gonna have to lean into Jesus' pretty clear teaching on family. And if you read everything he says about family, he's not as family friendly as he appears at first glance. He has a very nuanced perspective to family. Jesus is pro-family, that's clear, and we can point to all sorts of examples, but like I said, there's a, uh, there's a nuance that's required given the sum of what he says. He tells a grieving son, for example, to let the dead bury their own dead, to skip dad's funeral and follow him. Well, that's a little out there for us. Not usually the advice I give to people when they got a funeral coming up or something like that. That's Matthew 8. Just a few chapters later in Matthew 10, it'll be up on the screen for you, we read this. Jesus says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And I included that last sentence, by the way, because that just reminds us, this is one of the whoever statements. It means this is just Jesus' basic requirements for discipleship. He's not saying this in a specific context. This is anybody who wants to come after me, this has gotta be true of you. Luke 14, 26 and 27, he says something very similar. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, Such a person cannot be my disciple, and whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now what do we do in a culture like ours that elevates the nuclear family? When we read these passages, we find them a bit troubling, and so we domesticate them. We gotta tame them so that they fit within the worldview that we've already got. Here's the way Hellerman says, and I think he's right about this. He says, we convince ourselves that the difficult passages really do not quite mean what they appear to be saying. Jesus does not want to compromise our loyalty to our families. Jesus was talking about priority of convictions, not about behavior. His whole point is simply that we are to love God more than the members of our own families, or so we contend. And yes, of course, that's true. We should love God more than our own families. That's the Matthew passage right there. But Jesus' teaching goes beyond that. We need to reckon with it. If we're actually in submission to God and in submission to his word, we gotta let this speak to us here. So to make sense of this, to make sense of some of these hard passages, I want us to go back to one of uh, Jesus' earliest teachings on family near the beginning of his ministry where he establishes the primacy of God's family. So let's look at Mark 3, 31 to 35. We're gonna do this a little different this morning. It's a short passage and it's a pretty simple passage, so I'm gonna try and pull out the big idea from the passage. But because this is such a radical concept for us, I'm then gonna show you the implications of Jesus' teaching in a few other places places in scripture so you can see that this is really true. This is what scripture suggests. And then I'll do some application for us here today. So the big idea from Mark 3, 31 to 35. Let me read the passage. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. A little bit of background here, okay? Actually, quite a bit of background to understand this. First, the immediate background is in verse 21. If you were to look up to there, you'd see that his family is coming to get him because they're worried that he's out of his mind. They think he's crazy because of his radical teaching. Some of you might be able to relate to that. You don't come from a Christian family, like that's my story. My family thinks I'm out of my mind, that's for sure, all right? So you get that. So they go to fetch him. They go to fetch him because he is bringing shame on their family's name. You see, they're a part of a strong group society. That means the group takes precedence over the individual. And so, again, the problem is that he's messing up their family. This is not just they got a brother and they think he's kooky. It's, it's different, and that's how it works in our culture. I would know that, I got four siblings, they think I'm kooky, and they're not here, they're not waiting outside right now to drag me out of church, okay? Because we're not a strong group society. We're a weak group society, which means the individual takes precedence over the group. You see this in all sorts of areas, by the way. So for example, it, it's no big deal for us in our culture to move away from our natural family. You get a job somewhere else, you pursue the career, that's fine, you move away. 
Or how about this one? Like this just makes sense to us. At a certain age, you just kind of move out of the home whether you're married or not. In fact, it's almost best to to establish your independence first. Do you know that that's just crazy in almost every other part of the world? (laughs) And certainly throughout all of history, this is not how it's done. But this this is just how we think. This is how our society thinks. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, by the way. I'm just saying we gotta make sure we understand what our culture is like compared to the culture that Jesus inhabits at this point. In the New Testament world, those things would be unheard of. We get this strong group ethos, and the group that took precedence over the individual was the family, specifically blood family, and that's gonna matter for us in a moment here. See, it's a little bit shocking to us, but if you think about at least your generation, at this time period, siblings were the closest relationship, closer even than husband and wife, because a husband and wife do not share a bloodline. So a wife is there basically to perpetuate the bloodline, produce children, but she still belongs to her bloodline. Which means, so uh, Amy and I, we're married, we're happily married, that's great and everything like that. We got the kids, they're mine, they got my blood in them, right? And now Amy, not that we don't have a good marriage and all that, we're gonna still be friends, hopefully we're companions and whatnot, but she's gonna be closer to her sister and her brother than she is to me. Okay, that's really weird to us. I'm also not saying that's right. That's just important. I actually think Genesis 2 undoes this. God's vision for marriage is completely against an individualistic society's view of marriage and a traditional society's view of marriage. So it just, it's, it's, that's on a different plane altogether. And all I'm trying to do is explain what the culture was like when Jesus said these words. So in Jesus' world, the group takes precedence over the individual The most important group is the family, and the most important family relationship is actually siblings, not spouses. You don't believe me, because I'm talking crazy, I get that. Let's look at some historical examples from roughly the same time period. So Herod, admittedly, Herod's not the guy you wanna look at for normal family dynamics. He murdered most of his family, that's kinda how he rolled. But Herod had one wife in particular that he truly loved, Miriam. And so Josephus, the the historian for the Jewish people at that time, said that he loved her beyond reason. He was crazy in love with her. That's what that means. Until his sister Salome feuded with her. And once that quarrel started, Salome basically came to Herod and said, who's it gonna be? And so Herod put Miriam, this wife that he loved beyond reason, to death for the sake of his sister sibling relationship, or this isn't just a a, a Jewish culture, this is Greco-Roman culture as well. Octavia, um, you talk about an interesting character in history. Uh, She was married to Mark Antony of Antony and Cleopatra fame, and the sister of Octavian, who uh, we will know in history as Caesar Augustus. Well, if you know your Shakespeare or your history well, you know what happens. Antony and Octavian end up in a civil war. And so she writes this series of letters to her brother pleading with him not to get into this war because she loved Antony. She says, I am the happiest wife and you would make me the unhappiest if this happens because I would have to choose between my husband and my brother. Well, the civil war happens. She pleads unsuccessfully. And what happens when war breaks out? She leaves her husband and goes back to her brother because that's what you do. The sibling relationship is more important than the marriage relationship in this culture. So with that background, okay, with all that background, consider what Christ does here. The strong group shows up and asks him to act in his family's best interest. And he is the head of the family. He's the patriarch because he's the oldest living male. Joseph is almost certainly dead at this point because he's not here, that's how we know. So he's the patriarch of the family and they're saying, family needs you, man. And he looks at them and he says, who is my family? And he looks around at his followers, the company of those who submit to the will of God. Later he'll describe what the will of God is. It's to believe in the one that God sent, that is, it's to believe in Jesus. So he looks at the company of his followers and says, you are, you are my family. That, by the way, is the wonder of the gospel right there. Let's not pass over how incredible that statement is. At the fall, in the Garden of Eden, we looked at the last couple weeks, or actually it's the passage we're looking at next week as well. Uh, Adam and Eve fractured their relationship with God, for all of us, fractured the relationship with God and each other. 
I mean, immediately Adam's like, well, it's the wife you gave me. Like, it's her problems. We get blame shifting. We get court rules, the, the birth of the gender wars, all of that. Well, how, how can we possibly come back into the presence of God with this relationship fractured? Christ, by his death, acting as priest and sacrifice in the temple where the sacrifice is offered, cleanses us if we trust in him so that we can enter back into God's presence. So he repairs the fractured relationship between us and our father and us and our siblings. Because if you've got God as father, you've got siblings. <laughs> A lot of us claim that, of course. So that's, that's what happens there. But at the same time, <clears throat> It's impossible to overstate how shocking what he says would have been to those present. It would have been an audible gasp in the room, this group of followers sitting in a circle around him going, what? (laughs) Because he does two things in this moment. First of all, he models the new covenant community that he's creating, what we'll call the church. He models the church on the most important group in the ancient Near East at this time, which is the family and siblings especially. So he models it on that piece, but then he also sets that new community above the natural family on the scale of relational priorities. Just absolutely shocking. It's important for us that we understand that piece though because again, we put siblings lower. So we gotta make sure we read this in the context in which he said it. He's putting the community of faith at the top of our relational priorities list. It's, it's easy for us to read this passage in our culture today because we're like, sure, of course, it's easy for me to call you all my siblings because I don't listen to my siblings. <laughs> you know, like they're fun to hang around with at Christmas and watch the big game with or something, but that's it. I'm not getting a lot of input from them in my life or anything like that, but that's not what Jesus is saying here, right? He's saying, no, no, that's the most important relation. That's like different than with my wife and kids, for example. That's a different story. He's creating that sort of strong group for us. So here's the big idea. The big idea, it's, it's simple but shocking at the same time. The church family has priority over the individual member and the natural family. That's what Jesus is teaching quite clearly here. And I think we understand this, of course, because, look, my natural family is not my forever family. Amy and I, as I said earlier, we're happily married. But she is my sister in Christ, first and foremost. And when we get to glory, we will not be married, but we will still be brother and sister. When I baptized Karis, my oldest daughter, this is what I said right before I baptized her, was, you know, you're, you're my daughter, and in this life, you're gonna be my daughter the whole time. If you come up out of the baptism, you're gonna be my sister too. And when we go into glory, she's gonna be my sister. That's what we mean by that, that, that precedence, right? This is the eternal family. So we can't separate loyalty to God from loyalty to God's people. The New Testament does not allow us to do that. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, said back in about 250, no one can have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. I think that's exactly right. Although if we were to phrase it in terms of Mark 3 here, what it really would be is no one can have God for his father who has not God's children as his brothers and sisters with all that that entails. So our priorities shifted. It's no longer God, family, church, and others. It's now God's family, my family, others. It's the only way to make sense of all of Jesus' teaching on the subject in the rest of the New Testament as well. So let's see that. Let's tease this out by looking at the implications now. If God's family has priority over the individual and the natural family, We'd expect to see that in the New Testament, and that's what we're gonna look at. We would expect to see them living out the implications of that truth, maybe in their unity, their their solidarity with one another, and their submission to the community. Paul says, submit yourselves to one another in Christ. So we're just gonna go a first, uh, a few chapters ahead. Mark chapter 10 will be up on the screen. You don't have to turn there. Mark chapter 10, though, so a little bit of context. First of all, I know you're all starting to read. Don't read. We're not there yet, all right? Listen. Okay, so Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he's like, well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus is like, you know, it's the Ten Commandments, no big deal. Um, and the rich young ruler's like, got it, haven't killed anybody, didn't commit adultery, I'm doing great. 
And then Jesus says, yeah, just the one problem, you love money more than God. So just take care of that one, give away all your possessions and come follow me and then we're good. And the guy goes away dejected because it's really hard to give up everything to follow Jesus. Well, Peter chimes in at this point because Peter's Peter. And so he says this, now you can read. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Notice, by the way, who isn't on that list? Spouse. <laughs> Right? Brothers and sisters come first in the list because the sibling relationship is so important. So brothers and sisters get mentioned first because that's strong sibling group, but, but here's Jesus' point. Jesus assumes that because he has created a new family that has priority over even the natural family, that his, this new community will relate to one another as members of a strong family group. And that will be especially true if somebody is cut off. Like some of us, you know, my family and God's family, we're hoping there's coterminous. There's gotta be a better way to say that. I can't think of it right now though. Like it's the same group. Like I'm hoping my family's part of God's family. We don't always have to choose. That's not true everywhere. Not true in every situation. There are plenty of people who when they say, I'm gonna follow Jesus, the family kicks them out. And what happens then? Well, Jesus says you lose your house, your field, your brothers and sisters, you got a hundred more of them. What is he saying? This is not the health wealth gospel here. I don't want that house. You've got to name it and claim it. No, because he mentions persecutions, by the way. So clearly not the health wealth gospel. We're talking about something else. No, he's saying you're going to get the houses of your church family, the forever family of God. You're going to get new siblings if you need them. You're going to get surrogate parents and surrogate kids if that's what it takes to follow Jesus. That word fields is interesting too because field is, that's your income stream, Right? And so this, this assumes that we're gonna treat each other like family means we're gonna shoulder the material burdens of those who are struggling in our family. And Barnabas, by the way, he reads this passage literally. I mean, you wanna see the strong group in action, look at Acts chapter four. Here's verse 32. It's kinda uh, the description of the church at this moment. It says this, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. It'd be way too individualistic. They would never do that. But they shared everything they had. And just a few verses later, you can see that Barnabas sells one of his fields, brings the money, lays it at the apostles' feet so that they can distribute it to those who are in need. I am not my own. I belong to God. And by extension, I belong to his family. This goes beyond Jesus, though. Paul, in particular, develops this assumption that the church is gonna be the family of God. He calls us brothers and sisters a lot. If you read through Paul's letters, you see it, a whole bunch. It's actually interesting, pay attention to when he starts using a lot of family language too. But let's look at one place in particular, this is when there are Christians in Corinth who are suing each other. And he says this, we're kind of picking up mid-argument, but here's verses four to eight for you. First Corinthians six, four to eight. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned by the church? Are you going to secular authorities? They don't even know the word of God. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between brothers? I put that in brackets, by the way, because in the NIV, they translate it as believers just for stylistic variation, but the word that's used there is brothers. But instead, one brother takes another brother to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Society at this point was every bit as litigious as our society is. Now, we're litigious because we just want money. We just want to make an easy buck. That's what, where it comes from in our culture. Back then, it wasn't about the money. It was because honor was so important. And so you would go to court to defend your honor. And there's only one relationship strong enough where you would rather suffer injustice than be proved right in the courts. Any guesses what relationship? Family. That's the one where you go, okay, uh, I, I take one for the team here. Did you notice, by the way, Paul uses the term brother four times in these five verses. 
It's like this heavy concentration. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians 1 quite a few times, and then it's like almost none until we get to chapter 6. He's going to do it a lot in chapter 7 too, but we don't have time to go to that one. So there's this, this concentration of the term. Why is that? Part of that is because he's helping them remember that relationship and act on it. Like We don't usually use our, our relationship status when we address each other. I don't usually refer to my children as daughters. Daughters, come here, daughters. That's just not how we speak to each other. When do we use family language? When would I say, daughter, dearest, love of my life, light of my eyes, could you go get me my slippers? <laughs> right, that's how we do it. That's how we use family language, because we're going, hey, in the light of this relationship, you got some obligations, right? Make good on those obligations for my sake, wouldn't you? That's what Paul's doing here. It's not for his benefit, but he's saying, think of the relationship that you have here. So he's saying, not only do you have wisdom and the ability to judge, 1 Corinthians 2, he says we have the very mind of Christ, but also, more importantly, we've got family solidarity. We couldn't possibly sue each other. I heard a story of a youth group incident youth group's famous for incidents. So in this incident, <laughs> a fender was dented by a person, by the way, so just goes to show you what youth group games are like, okay? Uh, again, please don't sue the church, that's what we're talking about, that's why I mentioned this one. So, so Fender is dented by somebody in the youth group, and it was one of the kid's cars that was dented, and this is a kid who had bought the car himself, had saved for a long time to buy it. Youth leader's like, I get it, you know, all right, so the person who did this, you know, it was their fault kind of thing, just talk to the dad, you know, he's a deacon in the church, it's gonna be fine, all right, I'm gonna pay for it, he's got the money, it's no big deal. Well, this dad, this deacon in the church refused to pay and actually said, go ahead, try and sue me. I will win. I was like livid when I read this story. It's such an appalling rejection of the family mindset. Like if that isn't a moment for church discipline, I don't know what is. It didn't happen in that case, which tells you something else about our weak group that we've got at this point. Like that's one of those moments to go, well, you're not a deacon anymore, that's for sure. And we gotta talk about whether or not you're willing to repent or we're gonna have to ask some harder questions. But you can just see, in these handful of passages we've looked at, we could look at many others, you can see the implication clearly. The family that Jesus creates acts like family. The strongest group identity that these people have. And so with that, let's turn to the application, what this means for us, especially in our culture. And we'll return to the story I told uh, at the beginning of this couple that incredibly submitted to the wisdom of God's family. A truly exceptional act on their part because you almost expect the opposite. Why? Because we got God, family, church, others. That's the way our priorities work. And so what happens, the couple's gonna go, look, we think God is in this. We've been praying about this. And all that really matters for us when we make decisions is whether or not we feel like we have peace about the decision. Not in here, by the way, but that's how we approach this because we're individualistic. So we think God is in this, and then how dare the church way down here tell the family what to do? Family's more important than the church. These kids need a mother. We're ready to get married and on and on and on. But what if I've argued is true and I think quite clearly that it is? We cannot separate loyalty to God from loyalty to God's family. So there's the new number one, God's family, my family, others. That has real implications. We talked about this. We need to act like family, the strongest group. So let me suggest two broad applications. You'll have time in your community groups to work through specific applications, okay? So these are just broad applications for us, two broad streams of application. The first is exactly what we see in the story that I keep sharing uh, about this couple, and that is that we submit our decision-making process to the faith community. Should I marry this person? I don't know, let's go ask the church. Now let's talk about this in community group. Let's talk about this in journey group. Let's talk about this with the pastors. Should I take this job offer? Requires a move. Would mean that we wouldn't be able to be a part of this congregation anymore. I don't know, let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it at a journey group, and a community group, and the pastors, and the elders. Whatever it is, we submit our decision-making process to the faith community. Some of this is just simple wisdom, of course. You are one person, even if you're having this conversation with your spouse, that gets you up to two people, that's not enough. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. What separates the wise and the fool? The fool assumes he knows 
the right answer. And the wise, not so confident. And so seeks advice. Or Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel. With many advisors, they succeed. So just simple wisdom, but it's more than that. It's an, ex- an acknowledgement that we can deceive ourselves and get caught up in our own idolatry, including the idolatry of the nuclear family. So we need help. We need people to speak into our lives and make sure that that's not happening. I love this story in Acts. It just pictures this. It's not talking about family here. We don't get family language, but it just pictures this idea of like, I don't trust myself. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna get some help. So here's Acts 16, verses nine and 10. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, period. Because, you know, he's the apostle Paul, and he just had a vision from God. So what do you do? You call the team, you know, he's the apostle for preaching and vision, and so, you know, he gets to say what we're gonna do as a group, that kind of thing, and so he says, hey guys, had this vision, here's where we're going. But no, it's, there's not a period there. It says, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. That word concluding is so important. In English, participle is just a participle. In Greek, it has number, person, and gender. This is in the plural. We concluded, the group of us who got together. So Paul had gotten up the next morning and said, guys, I had a vision about somebody begging us to go to Macedonia. What do you think? And they concluded together. They reasoned together and said, yeah, no, that makes sense. I think this is what's true. If Paul needs wise counsel and called a family counsel, then you and I certainly need counsel. Certainly need counsel. Three key areas in particular. All areas that we make decisions about as individuals in our culture. Your residence, your career, and your spouse. I choose where I live what I do and whom I marry. Again, that's not true in most cultures, by the way. That's just totally crazy stuff for most cultures throughout most of history, but that's how we work here. That's just, this is just how we do things. But you put yourself in a strong group and things change. You submit the individual will to the church family's interests because you know that those are higher priority than your own. Again, does this mean we're going back to arranged marriages? I, mean, I got four daughters, like, yeah, I'm open to it, okay? Like, I'm not lying here, let's talk about this, but no, no, but this just means that we go, here's who I think I'm gonna marry. Like, here's the person I, I think I would like to marry. Again, what do you guys think? Just bring some people in in this whole conversation. Uh, Bruce Molina, in his study, uh, a book was called Christian Origins and Cultural Anthropology. So he's trying to figure out what the culture of the church was like in the first century. He writes this, he says, the person perceives himself or herself to be a member of a church family and responsible to the church for his or her actions, destiny, career, development, and life in general. The church family has priority over the individual member. That is crazy. (laughs) But that's what the church was like. Go back to Cyprian, he's a great example of this. So as Bishop of Carthage, uh, he heard a story from one of his pastors who was asking him what to do in this case where um, a guy had come to faith out of the acting uh, community. And back then, first century, uh, uh, acting was bound up with paganism. Like they were totally inseparable. And so the Christian community regarded it as simply immoral to be an actor. Like you couldn't help but participate in pagan rites if you were doing this. And so um, Cyprian, this is actually when he said that bit about you can't have the church, uh, God is father without church is mother. He said, you're gonna have to tell the guy to quit. And quit not just his job, but his career, like his livelihood. He says something else though also at this point. Not only does he do that, but he's saying, he he told the church then, this local church that had Marcus, the actor, as part of it, he says, now look, he's given up his livelihood. Guess what that means? That's Mark chapter 10, right? That means you guys gotta take care of him. And then he even extends it beyond the local church, of course, and says, if you guys can't do that, if that's too much of a material burden, let me know. We will take care of it. We'll get all the churches together to do this. Like that's, Unthinkable today, but how the church functioned and how the church was meant to function. And by the way, the subtitle of this series, we keep going back to this, is the joy of submission in an age of individualism. There is joy to doing that, this whole submitting the decision-making process to the church as a whole, or you know, a community of people who know you well. We pay an incredible price for our individual freedom. 
I mentioned a clear example of the people who get married, doesn't matter what anybody else says about it, and those marriages are bad or they fail. That's the price of not having other people speak into your life. Or again, just the, the lack of a strong group means that we might move across the country or something like that means we're away from uh, our family, natural family, which we think of as our support network. But you put yourself in the context of the church, that support network is totally different. God may call you away from your natural family. That's part of God's family, my family. We got called away. We were down in South America. Our oldest two kids were born in South America. My parents loved that. You know, you can understand, right? But of course, that meant we were isolated too. Well, like, who's teaching us how to do this parenting thing? The church. That's who. We had surrogate moms right there with us. You know, grandmas, surrogate grandmas for the, for the kids. Two women in particular. One died last year, the other one still a good friend. So you see how much better this, is. this truly is joy and submission. You're facing a major decision call a council, call a family meeting. Let's get some input here and so you can experience the security of multiple godly inputs, support, and all the rest. Second broad stream of application is what we see in Acts chapter four, the story with Barnabas. It's what we might call family solidarity. Family solidarity. Just, uh, the, the idea that I submit all that I have to the good of the family what the family needs. So I, I might sell a field and bring a proceeds to the church because I see another family in need that's part of God's family and we wanna take care of them like, I, like we would with our natural family. So three key areas again where we can practice this family solidarity can look very different for different people but time, resources, and home come to mind for me. Time, resources, and home. The time piece, of course, if we put God's family top and our relational priorities, it means we're gonna make time for each other. The writer of Hebrews says, don't forsake meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. You read in Acts chapter two, this early community is meeting together daily, daily. That doesn't mean coming to church to go in the programs of the church. Like, that's the last thing I want you to do, okay? Like, we try and do church as simply as we can. We got Explore Hour, Sunday service, journey groups, and community groups. That's all we ask people to do. It's not that much. Why? So you got that time to actually connect with people relationally. Practice that family solidarity, this everyday engagement. And of course, the time also requires um, energy. Uh, the part of the time is going to be spent in service, you know, all that. We can, we, could, we could multiply out the application from here. So time, resources then as well. This might mean formal giving. Somebody sells a field, and again, Barnabas brought it to the the apostles laid at their feet. I don't know where, where this is needed. Go ahead and do what you need to do. That's part of what we do as Christians, formal giving. But it might also just be informal response to needs. Somebody's going through something, car broke down. You know, we, we, could, we could talk to the church about the fellowship fund or you know what, I could just put cash in an envelope in their mailbox. That's easy. We could just do that as well. And then home, which of course gets at time and resources too. See, in Mark chapter 10, when Jesus said, um, if anybody loses their home because of the gospel, they're gonna get 100 other ones. Do you know what Jesus did right there? He gave your home away. It's not yours. It belongs to Jesus, and it belongs to the church. My home is not my own. It belongs to God. We talked a lot about this in the hospitality series we did last year, so I'm not gonna go through all of that, but uh, plenty of application there. I actually wanna conclude this sermon and this series on submission uh, by almost pivoting to our next series as well, to introduce the next series with this final quote. Because God's family includes singles, of course. Important part, God's family. Again, look at 1 Corinthians 7 and how Paul uses family language in that whole discussion of marriage and singleness and all that. Singles are often marginalized in the church to our shame, of course. But that also includes those who are single because they are same-sex attracted but in submission to God. And so they're living a celibate lifestyle. How does the church respond there? Wesley Hill, who is a person in that category, same-sex attracted, living a celibate life, in his book on Christian friendship says this, and I'll wrap up with this quote. It really captures submission to the community as well as gets us ready for the next series. He says this, he says, I imagine Christian communities in which friendships are celebrated and honored where it's normal for families to live near each other, to live near or with single people, 
where it's expected that celibate gay people would form significant attachments to other single people, families, and pastors, where it's standard practice for friends, church members, to spend holidays together, or vacation together, where it's not out of the ordinary for friends, church members, to consider staying put, resisting the allure of constant mobility for the sake of their friendships in the church. I imagine a church where genuine love isn't located exclusively or even primarily in marriage, but where marriage and friendship and other bonds of affection are all seen as different forms of the same love we are all called to pursue. Let's pray together. Lord, as we continue to submit our lives to you, to submit ourselves to the authority of your word, we see that that requires we submit ourselves to the faith community as well. This is a paradigm shift for many of us because we inhabit an individualistic culture. It's how we were raised, it's the air we breathe, and so a lot of this doesn't make sense for us and we've got some work to do to figure out what that means for us personally. What changes need to happen as we respond to your word for us this morning. Lord, by your spirit, would you help us to see what that response is? And would you help us to practice what we heard this morning by working out that response in community? Whether formally as we discuss this in community groups in the next couple of weeks, or informally as we pull some people aside and chat through it. But Lord, don't let us walk out of here the same as when we came in. We want to be more like Jesus. And part of that means living in submission and solidarity with the family he created. And it's for his sake we ask this. Amen.